Our final speaker of this conference, I'm really proud to say, um, is a friend of mine. And although it wasn't until five years ago that we actually met, we corresponded for ever so many years before. And the tone of those correspondence changed a lot back and forth over the years. Steve LaPlume was born in Lemonster, Massachusetts. He grew up in this town. Some of you in this audience know him, knew him when he was a kid, knew his sister, and she was a police officer. His father was a police officer. The family has a history in this town. He went to high school here. He dreamed his dreams of what his life was going to be like when he was older here. He wanted to be a nurse, but the facility where he could have studied closed down. Economy was bad at the end of the 70s, early 80s. And so he decided to enlist in the Air Force. His dad had been in the Air Force, and uh, he followed him in. He became a law enforcement police officer and ultimately was stationed at a base in Suffolk, England called RAF Bentwaters. He knew the guys whose names I've mentioned here. And while Steve was not involved in any of the events that transpired over the three nights that we designate officially as the Rendlesham Forest UFO incident, he was involved and he had his own experience and the impact of it, like for Larry and Jim and John, other witnesses I've spoken to, resonates to this day. Before I bring him up, just want to add one thing parenthetically. When you do this work, and you hold yourself to as high a standard as you can as a nonfiction investigative writer, you take pride in getting things correct. And if you make an error, and if it's brought to your attention, you have several options. I have colleagues, very nice people, I think, but they kind of take the attitude of members of Congress or Parliament that if you brought up a, a mistake that I've made, I'm a tough guy, you know, I can handle it. I'm just going to ignore it. People will forget about it and we'll move on. I don't have to admit it. Well, I feel just the opposite. When I make an error, I need for people to know that I know that I made the error. And through what I've come to understand is actually a very reasonable um, sequence of events, I made an error. And the error appears in that edition of Left at Eastgate. It also appears in the new book. And it involves somebody named Steve LaPlume. And Steve started to read my new book and then stopped. And I hope he'll finish it at some point. But what he brought to my attention is that I credit him with making a statement that he never made and being a security cop, not a law enforcement cop. Well, I was horrified. I checked it immediately, and what I realized was this. In 1997, after Left at Eastgate came out, a number of the men who were involved, men who we name in the book, wrote to our publisher, to Larry, in the form of actual letters or email, which was forwarded on. And one of them was a security cop whose name was also Steve, whose last initial was also L, Steve Longero, not Steve LaPlume. And I confused them. And I credited that statement to Steve LaPlume, and I included that same statement in Deliberate Deception, my new book. I was wrong. And you should be aware of that. And what a novelty to be wrong for the first time in my life. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve McClure.
<laughs> and I need to read this in the light. Can you slide that a little too? Right. You have to excuse me, I'm not a professional speaker. Um, and actually, quite honestly, uh, how's that? Okay. Who's here prior to me? <laughs> Okay. Um, I've got a few notes here, but quite honestly, I really don't need them. The only reason I have them is because we've got some slides showing up here. I want to make sure they coincide. Um, I lived through this event. Like I said, I don't need these notes. Um, and the reason I'm here before we start the, the presentation is um, it's more of actually uh, selfishness. Um, I was born and raised here. Uh, as he said, my father was a police officer here, and I come from a very military background. I had uncles that landed on D-Day at Omaha Beach, and you know, very proud of our military background. So when I got released from the service, uh, 10 months after I entered, it was a big embarrassment to myself as well as to my family. So um, today I'm here very much out of character for me. Um, I try to keep a very low profile uh, just due to my past uh, experiences and professions, uh, which I'll get into here in a little bit. So um, public speaking, I've never come out and talked about this. Um, uh, Steve took me to a MUFON meeting about three years after the event. I was very uncomfortable with it. Uh, I had a very bad stigma, you know, always getting, you know, the whole tinfoil hat treatment type thing. So, uh, so I just kind of shunned the whole thing, just moved on with my life. Um, but you just can't get away from this, it seems. Uh, as much as I tried to not let uh, Ben Waters define who I was and my future, um, it, it ultimately did. Um, do we want to start the uh, slideshow? So, um, this is me. <laughs> I was born here in Lemonster Hospital in uh, 1962. I'm 53 years old. And uh, uh, I was born here, raised here. I went to, uh, as he said, Lemonster High School. Uh, I went through Boy Scouts. This is uh, Salisbury Beach, some of you locals here. Um, um, this is me over here on the right hand side. Hang on, I got a pointer. This is me over here. If some of you guys are locals, you might know Norman LaPointe. <laughs> He's a friend of mine here. Um, so, you know, I, I went through here. Um, uh, I had my first motorcycle accident right in front of the uh, city hall. Uh, and right across the street from that at the Pilgrim Church, uh, Troop 4, I went through Boy Scouts. So, I mean, I'm very much proud of the fact that I'm here from London. So, I love this town. Um, but after, after all these events, as I said, I was pretty embarrassed about the whole situation and uh, kind of moved on with my life. Keep going. Um, Played for Amberlight, played uh, baseball here. Um, now this picture here, um, this was taken actually a couple of weeks before I entered the service. This skinny little geek here <laughs> weighed all of about 143 pounds. Um, I remember going to the recruiting office and I was eating bananas on the way to my physical, trying to gain more weight because I had to weigh 145 to pass the minimum weight for my height. So um, this is my graduation picture from basic training. And, um, Okay, now um, you can see here, this is my security police badge, and this is my uh, expert marksmanship badge. Um, I, whatever they put in my hand, I ended up being an expert on, whether it was a machine gun or a grenade launcher. And um, I was assigned to the United States Air Forces Europe, which is our pin over here. Uh, next. And then, since I've never really publicly spoken, I wanted to show proof that I was actually in the Air Force and I am who I am. And, I, the blacked out parts are just my social security number, just for, <laughs> yeah, you know, identity theft being what it is nowadays. So, uh, so as they were saying, you know, I was a security specialist, and actually, Peter, um, I was trained as a security specialist, but because my security clearance hadn't come through, uh, the reason I was on the East Gate was I was temporary duty assignment to law enforcement. So I never actually worked as a security police officer. Um, law enforcement was shorthanded, and since my clearance hadn't come through because there were so many new people coming onto the base and so many clearances, um, I, I guess I was on the bottom of the pile. So, um, so they just assigned me to law enforcement, where, is, uh, where I did my duty. Uh, this is my honorable discharge, my regular Air Force. Uh, I got out the 13th of April, 1981, which was basically, uh, about, like I said, about 10 months. I went in July 10th of uh, 1980. Uh, now, when I went in in July 10th of 1980, I actually joined up, as, he, as Peter had mentioned, um, I couldn't get into the nursing school I wanted to. I was very distraught over that, didn't know what to do with my future. So I joined the service um, in 1979 on the delete enlistment program. So when I got out of basic training, I actually had time and grade, and I had a couple stripes, which would be the equivalent of a corporal. So I was a senior airman. Uh, can we go back one more? So, 
Um, what I wanted to point out on this is right here it says 81st Security Police Squadron, United States Air Forces Europe. So that you know, just proof, this is the DD-214. If you've been in the military, everybody knows you keep your DD-214 for life. Uh, when I go to the Veterans Administration, I have to bring this, and, you know, for paperwork-wise. Um, okay, the next one. And, all right, <laughs> this is me. <laughs> what I wanted to point out with this picture was, um, you know, there's been a lot of ridicule about the, um, I guess, the quality of the, the police officers that were there on the base that night. And um, we were very serious about what we were doing. I mean, when I joined the Air Force, I joined, like I said, because I had nothing to do. Um, but after I joined the Air Force, we had this little incident in Iran with hostages being taken. And, you know, I started to get a sense of pride and patriotism that I really hadn't had before. You know, just maturing up, growing up as a young man. And um, at the time this was taken, we had a solidarity union going on in Poland. The Russians were massing troops on the Polish border. I mean, it was a pretty tense time. And um, we were all very, very serious about what we were doing. Um, you know, we had, you know, all the armor movement we wanted. And if somebody came on base, we were going to handle the situation. We weren't a bunch of Keystone cops. You know, and I really resent the fact there's been a lot of talk about these, you know, Keystone cops running through the woods getting chased by a lighthouse. You know, it's just ridiculous, okay? <laughs> um, okay, next. All right, and then I know Peter showed, but I just want to point out this is Ipswich here. Next. And just, this is the Woodbridge area. Not where we're at over here. Okay. So this is the base right here, the airstrip. Um, can you go back one more? Because I, I want to point out something. All right. This is Orford. Okay. So the lighthouse is somewhere over in this area. Okay. The base is over in this area. Okay. And um, I, I'm telling you, there's no way that that lighthouse flew over my head. <laughs> it, had, it would have had to lift off this moorings and move five miles and hover over my head. And it's just physically impossible. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so here's the runway here. Now, on the runway here, um, if I get my orientation right, right over here is the east gate, and there was like a little blast wall there. And if you can turn the next picture, yeah, here it shows. This is what I call the blast wall. And what it was was when the airplanes come over here and they turn around to take off, their exhaust would come and their exhaust would impede anybody on the road here. So they put this wall up here. Um, this is a little different than what I remember it because I remember it in 1980, and I don't know when this picture was taken, but this gate here, uh, when I was there, it was actually just a simple piece of pipe going across with a lock on it. It was a combination lock. 78-78 was the combination. <laughs> Still remember. So, so things are a little bit different here. We had a guard shack over here. It was just a simple white um, fiberglass guard shack. It had heat in it, you know, for the winter. Uh, next one. But when you're looking out at it, this was typical of the road. The, the, um, there was a clearing over here. We always had like a, a clearing, so if anybody was coming through, you know, attacking or whatever, we had a good clear field of fire. Um, when I saw my, uh, when I saw this UFO, it was coming from this direction here, which I'll get in, into here in a minute. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is my little, <laughs> this is my little paint picture here. All right, so if this is the blast wall. This is north, the, the uh, North Seas over here. Okay. When I first had this, uh, first had this sighting, I was standing right here where the black is. Here's the guard shack. Here's the gate. Okay. I had two incidents that night, which I think is significant. The first uh, incident we had, uh, my partner with me was senior Airman Palmer, and I was kind of stuck in. I don't. Know, I want to say like I was a redheaded stepchild. To tell you the truth, I wasn't officially part of law enforcement, but I was part of the security police. But as I said, because I didn't have a security clearance, they pushed me off of law enforcement. So law enforcement didn't know what to do with me. I didn't have a pistol. I had a machine gun. I had an M16 with me. It's not really good to go house calls. You know, this M16 is a little harsh for calling domestic squabbles. You know? so, um, so I was relegated to bathroom breaks and, um, you know, giving people time to go to the chow hall and, you know, delivering food to some of the perimeter posts and stuff like that. And uh, you might think that's kind of a, a real, you know, not a very good assignment, but I realized after a while I was in a pretty good spot. I didn't have any responsibilities. I didn't have to do any more training, any testing. I was just stuck in the middle, and you know, I, I knew I'd eventually I, you know, I'd get my security clearance. And I was very happy with the Air Force. They'd given me the, uh, the assignment I wanted. Although when I got my piece of paper that said, you're assigned here, it said Unkin. So I went up to the sergeant at the desk and said, where the heck is Unkin? Is that some island out in the middle of the Pacific? And he said, no, you idiot, it's the United Kingdom. Go sit down. <laughs> so, so, and that's, that was my first choice with the United Kingdom. Um, so I got the assignment I wanted, I got, you know, a decent base, I was very happy, the people I worked with were all very professional, and uh, I didn't have any issues, all right? Um, I didn't want to get out of the Air Force, I signed up for six years, I plan on possibly making a new career after six years. So, um, 
again, senior, I keep calling him senior Airman Palmer because he used to force me to call him that. He was actually an airman, but because he had one more stripe and he had an ego, I had to call him senior Airman Palmer. So, and I still do, just out of respect. <laughs> so, um, so senior Airman Palmer and I, here, go back like this. So senior Airman Palmer and I were standing over here and we were talking about the UFO incident. Um, it was kind of hush-hushed, and my first, um, the first I ever heard of it was I was hungover. It was Christmas. I had, we, we would work three days swing shift, 3 to 11, three days 11 to 7, and then we'd have three days off. And it just so happened I had days off during the Christmas break. So I had a party at my dorm room and stuff, and I was a little, like I said, I was a little hungover. <laughs> and uh, I went down to the day room, and they were talking about some of the guys that got chased through the woods by a UFO. That's the first thing I ever heard was, yeah, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so -and -so got chased through the woods by a UFO. So uh, we were in the day room. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, we, you know, night shift typically gets off at 7 o'clock. You turn in your weapons. You're usually back in the barracks no later than 7 to 45, 8 o'clock. So it was about 10, 10, 15 when some of these guys came in, and they still had their... We had these alert bags that had our flak vests, our helmets, and extra gear in it. And they had their alert bags over their shoulders like we always used to carry them. And they were coming through the day room, and it was the guys that got chased by the UFO. So they started getting harassed pretty hard by the other guys in the day room. Oh, did you see any little green men, blah, 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 you know. And um, they just, honestly, i gotta, I got to demonstrate this. They had their bags over the head, and their heads were down like this, walking through the day room, just trying to muddle through it, you know. And I was on the other side of the day room, and I asked them, I said, hey, man, what did you say? I'd really like to, like to know. And I was quickly told to go F off, and they just kept walking past me. So I hadn't heard anything about it for weeks. Um, I'd gone through three cycles of... Um, uh, swing shift, night shift, day shift, and then this particular night, as I said, we were standing here, and we were just talking about it. They were talking about, you know, could it have been the lighthouse that they saw the lights from the lighthouse or this and that, and, um, you know, we were just kind of sitting there shooting the bull about it, and we were looking over here towards the south, and what we saw up in the sky was, you know, I'm sure you've all seen, like, satellites cruising across the sky. It's just a, looks like a star floating across the sky. Well, I'm going to go off. Don't pay attention to this. What we saw was... The satellite, I'm going to try to hold this steady. The satellite was cruising along, and then it started doing this number. All the way across the sky, and then it kind of went behind some clouds. So we're like, gosh, what the heck was that? I mean, this thing was dropping from, you know, if, from the sky, you know, I don't know, the you know, site of elevation is maybe 70 degrees or something like that. But it was dropping from way up here, way down to here in our line of sight. I mean, there's thousands of feet. You know, there's no C-130 or no Jolly Greens. We had two Jolly Green helicopters up and one C-130 because Parma went down to the, uh, to the uh, tower and checked the radar and see what we had up there. So it was definitely not one of these graphs. So he came back and he said, what do you want to do? I don't know. You're the guy with the third strike. You tell me. So he said, well, we're supposed to call it in. So instead of putting any uh, heat on himself, he gets on the radio and says, Central Security Control, the plume just saw a UFO. Sorry. So um, uh, immediately the guard shack phone rang. It was Lieutenant England. He gets on the phone and he says, what would you see? I explained it. He said, stay there and let us know if you see anything else. Now at this point, the, uh, this craft that we saw doing these acrobatics up in the sky had gone behind some clouds. It was kind of a partly cloudy night. It really wasn't that cloudy at all. And uh, we lost track of it. And what it did was it traveled over here through the sky. And we kind of lost it over here around the forest behind some clouds. So when they came out, they said, Where did, where's the last place you saw it? Oh, we saw it over the forest. Well, not knowing all the events and everything and all the background, what happened, you know, we didn't understand that that was very significant, that it went over the forest. So they came out. The first person that showed up was Colonel Halt. He showed up in, I think it was like a British MG. I mean, his car was so small it almost fit under the gate. Um, it was just a little red car. Um, so he showed up, asked what happened. I think he might have been one of the ones, either him or Lieutenant England brought out a starlight scope. Um, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the starlight scope, it just takes the ambient light and uh, multiplies it so you can actually see what's going on. It's kind of got a good green hue to it. Um, he did that. Lieutenant England came out. He said, don't be nervous, but uh, um, Colonel Williams will be out. And uh, by the way, last week he was just promoted to general, but don't be nervous. <laughs> you know? um, and uh, just go ahead and tell them what you saw. Tell them, you know, we had a lot of protocols, so I had to stand there and say, you know, my post is all safe and secure to the whole bit and go through all that rigmarole. He was very professional, asked me what I saw. I told him. But just before he showed up, there was another base commander from Woodbridge that showed up. I believe it, was, it might have been Conrad. He was the deputy base commander. And uh, 
he showed up with his wife and a teenage kid, which is very out of character for a military operation. So it, it was just so bizarre that there would be civilians, you know, involved in a military, you know, situation. And what was weird was this girl had this Nikon camera, and I remember saying Nikon was 35 millimeter and all. And she was so jittery. She sat there with this camera going, oh boy, oh my God, I hope we get to see one. Oh. And I'm sitting there going, see one what? The thing was like thousands of feet up in the sky. What are you going to film, you know? I just had no concept of what was going on at the time. And uh, there was her teenage son, looked to be about 16, 17 years old, good looking kid, short brown hair. Um, before I go on, I, I want to explain something. I've got, I use the monk theory, I've got a gift and a curse. Um, I've got kind of this photographic memory where if I'm in a situation, I can roll it back like a film, um, which is great if you want to remember good stuff. But later on in life, I had a lot of bad stuff I remember too, so that's the curse part. I remember a lot of bad things in great detail. So when I tell you what I saw, I mean, I've got no reason. I'm not writing a book. I've, I've got nothing to do with this, you, you, with the UFO community. While I respect them very much, um, it's just not my lifestyle. You know, I maintain a very low profile. I work for a security firm. It's just, you know, this isn't me. <laughs> okay? So, um, so I really have no vested interest in this other than to tell the truth and basically kind of vindicate myself towards, you know, my city here and explain why, you know, my family got so embarrassed about me getting booted out of the service when I did. Okay? Um, so let me continue. So all these colonels show up, all this brass, all these people, and I can't really understand what's going on because we saw something up in the sky and it just didn't make any sense. Well, they all piled in a, um, a blue Air Force uh, station wagon with the yellow writing on the side, and they all took off down the road over here, and they took a right, and they went out of sight, and I didn't see them for 45, 50 minutes. And then they came back, so well, we didn't see anything. If you see anything, let us know, and you're posted on the gate for the rest of the night, which typically we close the gate at 7 o'clock, and I would go do bathroom breaks and you know, food breaks and stuff. So, um, so I was posted on there the rest of the night. So they gave me the starlight scope, and because there was the forest over here and everything, which I, quite honestly, it was pretty spooky, <laughs> um, I always sat with my back up against this blast wall, so there was nothing behind me. Um, so I just sat there, and we just, you know, I just kind of hung out for the next hour or so. And uh, then Palmer came back, and this red line indicates his patrol car. So he pulled up his patrol car, I came over, I was standing right over here on this side, he was standing over here on this side, and um, we were talking a little bit about what was going on. Now being at this gate quite often, um, we would see a lot of the A-10s come in, and they would take a flight path that would come in here and then land over here. This lighter green area was like uh, where all the, all the lights are when they come in on the airport, um, and the darker green is the forest area. So they would always come in here, and you could always tell their flight path coming. It was very low and slow. A-10s don't fly very fast, so it was very, very easy to see them coming in. They'd always come in in twos, and, uh, or generally they would. And uh, all of a sudden we saw some craft coming from this area over here, but it wasn't taking this normal flight path. It was coming in more of this way over here. Um, at first, it appeared just as a light coming across, looked like the aircraft coming in with its headlights on or their lights on. But um, as it got closer, uh, this is where things just really kind of got twisted. Um, it seemed like I had a lot of tunnel vision. As the craft came to the end of the road, as I cleared the forest and it got right around here, it seemed like I just suddenly had tunnel vision. The, uh, um, the craft itself didn't look like an airplane. It looked very cylindrical and it had kind of a fog around it. And you know, as, as I'm sitting here, you know, 35 years later or so, I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe the fact that it's cylindrical, maybe it was disc-shaped, and I did, because of the foggish around it, maybe it was, you know, I was just seeing the profile of it. I, honestly, it just seemed like it was cylindrical, more uh, cigar-shaped towards me. But as it got over our heads, um, one thing is, I didn't hear anything. I didn't, not that I didn't hear the craft, I didn't hear the craft at all, but I didn't hear anything. It was like somebody shut my ears off, okay? I remember just sitting there looking at this craft, coming over, it got over our heads. I remember looking up at it and thinking, God, Steve, check this out. This is going to be the greatest thing you ever saw in your life. You're looking at a UFO. Oh, my God. You know, I had my M16 on my shoulder. Never thought about unslinging it and shooting it. <laughs> you know, I just sat there looking up at this thing going, wow, check this out. You want to hit the next one? And I saw something very similar to this. Actually, when Sue and I were um, putting our presentation together, I, I was at the library and I stretched back and went, oh, God, it looked just like that. Let's take a, let's take a picture of that. So, and what it was was just, it was, a, it was a craft, it had some yellow and blue lights and I think a red light, but I, I just remember the blue and yellow light more. And it was just a square and a square and a square and it looked like some sort of a hatch, okay? 
Um, can we go back to the last slide? So the craft came over and it just basically hovered over here. Um, I, I want to say it hovered maybe half a minute to a minute at the most. And then it just slowly kind of meandered it over this way. As it went off, it just kind of rose and rose and rose and it went up into the sky and it just became a star and, you know, it was the same and we just lost track of it. So we, Palmer and I, I, I mean, I don't even remember Palmer being there. I was just so tunnel vision on this thing. And uh, Palmer turned and he said, do you want to call that it? And I said, hell no. And he said, okay. And that's the last can I actually even spoke of it. Um, I spoke to Palmer one time after that, um, just due to some incidents that happened. And uh, the night went on. Nothing, you know, special happened after that. Um, I was a little late getting back to the base. My sergeant came out and said, hey, what'd you see? I told him about the first incident. You know, Palmer and I kind of made a pact that we'd never talk about the second one. And um, he said, okay, fine. Um, I had missed the bus, so I had to go in and clear my weapons, turn them in. And I, it was raining out, and I had to hitchhike back to the barracks. Um, got back to the barracks, and things seemed to go normal for a while, until I got a knock on the door from uh, Larry Warren. Um, we were talking about coincidences the other night. The first time I met Larry Warren was in a barroom brawl. <laughs> I had flipped over the table because beer bottles and wine bottles were flying and stuff, and I had a date, so I flipped the table over and jumped on top of the girlfriend. He came over the table. <laughs> he was hiding. <laughs> and uh, after the fight stopped, he went back. We said our goodbyes and stuff, and I, I didn't even catch his name. And uh, we were walk I was walking down the hallway in Bentwater is in one of the dorms. I was like, hey, don't I know you? <laughs> and oddly enough, he was assigned to the same base I was. So, uh, so he and I talked, and we became friends and stuff like that. But he was on a different flight than I was, and you know, just because of the shift rotation and people sleeping on odd hours and stuff, I really didn't have a whole lot of interaction with him, just a little here and there. And uh, so he, Larry came into my dorm room and he said, hey, Steve, I want to talk to you. I said, all right. He goes, listen, I heard you, know, you had a sighting, you had an incident. And I was like, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I was just waiting for the whole you know, harassment to start. He goes, well, I did too. And he started telling me his story. And I'm not going to go into great detail, but the story he told me is the same story he told everybody else and he's been telling for the past 30 odd years. Um, it really hasn't changed, um, other than new information coming out. But the basic story is the basic story he told me. But one thing that disturbed me was he was talking about how uh, they got interrogated. And um, it wasn't so much the interrogation that scared me, it was the fact that the people were talking about bullets are cheap, you know, don't talk about this, you know, the whole thing. And I thought it was a very serious situation. Now, you can understand, I, I'm a geeky little, I mean, I was in the band. I was a band geek, okay? <laughs> um, you know, I ran track, I ran long distance. I was just a skinny little kid. You know, I just turned 18 a few months prior. I turned 18 when I was in boot camp. So, I mean, I was just this young kid. My sister over here, that's her. She can attest <laughs> to the fact that our mother was somewhat overbearing. She kept me very close to her apron strings, so I really didn't know anything about what was going on in the world. I really wasn't prepared to be out there. You know, I, I went, when I went in the service, I was glad I did because it kind of manned me up a little bit. But um, I, I was very nervous for my, uh, for my safety after that, especially when Larry comes back and says, yeah, hey, you know, um, they took me. They abducted me. They took me down somewhere. And, uh, you know, he was talking about an underground base and all this stuff and interrogations. And quite honestly, I was really scared for my well-being, okay? Um, what's the next slide? Just to... Oh, okay. Yeah, let's just leave it there. So, um, so I started getting pretty nervous about my, my safety. I didn't know what to do. I talked to my dad. Um, he said, I'm under a contract. There's no way I'm getting out of the service. Well, one thing led to another, and I started noticing, you know, you get the feeling of being followed. So I felt I was being followed, and I kept seeing the same couple of people all the time. And they always seemed to be behind me, looking at me, ahead of me, whatever. And after a while, I could identify these two individuals. But one night, I walked into the, um, to the All Ranks Club, went in there to get a beer, and I noticed these guys sitting down. So I went over to the bar that was near there. I asked the bartender if she knew who they were. She said that they were a temporary duty assignment from Germany or something because they didn't speak English. I said, okay, great. Well, I didn't smoke, so I asked her for a cigarette. Went over to, I waited for one of the guys to get up and go to the bathroom. I went over to the other guy that was sitting there and I asked him, hey, you got a light? He made, oh, I don't speak English. And I'm like, hey, a light, you know? Oh, okay. So I was like, you know what? And he lit my cigarette for him. I said, I don't really drink. Uh, excuse me. I said, I don't really smoke. I said, I just came over to tell you, you guys have the worst tale in the world. I'm on to you guys. And, you know, get the gigs up. I already know you're following me. So, you know, you don't have to follow me anymore because I already know you're there. 
and I went over to the other side of the room where they had a, a divider. They had some trellis work where you could get pizza and stuff like that. And uh, the other guy came back from the bathroom. The guy talked to him for a few seconds. He get up, and instead of leaving through the front door of the All Ranks Club where everybody goes in and out, it was the only entrance other than the fire entrance in the back, these guys got up and they went out the back fire entrance, which is non-typical. I've never gone out the back entrance. Nobody goes out the back entrance. That's where the garbage cans are, you know? So I kind of manned up a little bit and uh, uh, went over to the door and with a lot of uh, fear, <laughs> opened up the door a crack to see what was out there and saw a dark sedan with New York plates. And as I drove away, it was a Lincoln Mark IV. And I know it was because my uncle had one of these. I remember Uncle Eddie, he had a Lincoln Mark IV. And uh, uh, I, I recognized the vehicle right away. And I was like, huh, a dark sedan with New York plates. Oh, that's nice. Why would people on TDY from Germany you know, be driving a car, you know, an American car? It didn't make no sense. So at that point, I thought, okay, I'm into something way over my head, and I gotta get out of here. So um, I, I still continue to do my duty like I was supposed to do when playing the game. But at one point, um, one of my friends and I, we drank a fifth of Bacardi between the two of us, totally hammered, um, trying to figure out what I was going to do, just really just scared of, you know, what the next move was going to be. And I went into the All Ranks Club, and I heard the theme song from MASH playing. And I thought, huh, huh, I know what I'm going to do. Now, one thing I left out is um, when I was in the second grade, I had an IQ test, and I got, a, I'm not gonna break, I, I got an above 100, 140 IQ. So I sat there and I planned everything out and I thought, all right, I know how to get out of service now. I went back to my dorm room, grabbed the skin diving knife that I had and sliced my stomach open a few times. And uh, actually it didn't cut very well because it was dull. So I busted over and opened my uh, shaving razor and used that to cut my stomach open and uh, turned myself in for a suicide attempt, okay? Um, as I was on the phone downstairs talking, uh, some other airmen came by. Um, they said, hey, Steve, what are you doing? Stop. It ain't worth it, whatever, because I had this knife in my hand and my guts all bleeding. And uh, they started to come after me, and I took off. Um, being a long distance runner, there was a fairly few people on that base that could have caught me. <laughs> I used to do the two mile in nine and a half minutes, so it was pretty fast. <laughs> so, uh, so I ran around for a while. The cops chased me. I finally gave up in the soccer field. Uh, they jumped on me, they grabbed me, and they brought me over to the health clinic to get blood drawn to see whether I was on drugs or something. And uh, I didn't realize who it was at the time, but this very tall individual that had me, had me by my arm here with his left hand, he got his radio to somebody and said, hey, do you have that individual? He said, yeah, I do. I said, hell you do. And I smacked him as hard as I could with my elbow and took off again. <laughs> this time when they caught me, they weren't so kind. Um, and uh, it kind of roughed me up deservedly. And uh, I go back to the clinic. And from there, uh, just to make a long story short, um, I went through a series of uh, psychological tests at the health clinic. They uh, determined that I was uh, not suited for having a weapons card. They took my weapons away instantly that day. And uh, when I talked with the psychologist, he said, what do you want? I said, I want to go home. I don't want to be here. Get me out of here. He said, easy. I can do that. I'll have you home by April. I said, how are you going to do that? He said, failure to conform. I said, all right, what's that? He said, I'm going to write that you're immature. All right, deal. So that way, you know, it wouldn't affect me that much in civilian life and stuff. And I found that this captain was let a lot of people out of the service to the point where he finally got replaced. Um, I don't know why so many people were leaving this base other than it was just a remote base. You know, there was uh, a lot of suicide attempts on this base. There was a lot of alcohol on the base. So there was nothing there but a movie theater, a bowling alley, and a bar. So, I mean, and they all served alcohol, so what are you going to do, right? So, um, so I got out of the service and um, came back to Lemister embarrassed, um, really embarrassed. Uh, embarrassed my family, my father and everything. My father couldn't understand what was going on. I never really explained it to him. Um, I don't know, maybe Donna can help me out here. Did I ever explain anything to the family? No, not really, huh? I just kind of shut up about it. And uh, partied a little bit when I got back, and after a year, um, I just kind of took a different path. And the reason I took this path, which I'll talk about in a minute, was I just got kind of disillusioned with everything, with the government, with God. I mean, it just seemed like nothing mattered anymore. Like I was just told a lie my whole life about everything. I was, you know, was St. Leo's Church right down the street. I was confirmed over there. I was, you know, devout Catholic. And it just seemed like everything was just nothing but a bunch of BS. So I uh, made a conscious decision to uh, shun God, shun everything, and forget the government. I'm just going to go do my own thing. I like being a soldier. I like being in the Air Force. You know, I was very adapted to it. I worked for the Kelly Steel Erectors, who's still in business now, down off of uh, Visco Light Ave. Uh, there's a couple of shops of steel. Can you just keep going? 
uh, next one. All right, now I met this individual here, which you might want to look up on the internet. His name is Frank Camper, and uh, he's kind of an infamous mercenary. Uh, I went down to his training session that he had down in uh, Alabama, and I went through uh, some mercenary training, and uh, one thing led to another, and I found myself in Central America down in uh, fighting with the Contras in 1985. Um, I've done other stuff before that, but that's all I'm going to talk about because it's public. Um, I was involved with the Iron Contra affair. I had to give my testimony to the FBI with my involvement in it, and I was looking at 35 years in jail for violating the Neutrality Act, which means you can't leave U.S. soil and wage war in another country unless Congress or the President, you know, decrees it or gives you permission. So, okay, go ahead. Um, now, somewhere in between, Larry contacted me. Now, I had kept in touch with Larry. Every time I went down to do some training down in Alabama, I'd stop by Connecticut and say hi to Larry, and, you know, we'd go hit a bar or two or whatever. And um, uh, he sick the Japanese on me. <laughs> there was a Japanese film crew, um, and Larry had told me that he'd come out with this. Omni magazine had already printed, you know, you know, already broken the story and stuff. So this Japanese film crew came up, and for the first time, um, oh, this is this is the wrong. I don't know how we get that one in there. Okay, but let's go back. Let's go back one. No, one more. Okay. So as a mercenary, no, nope, four of them. Sorry. As a mercenary. I lobbied the uh, country of the Philippines to go and fight for them. This is my rejection letter. <laughs> I, I lobbied a lot of countries, South Africa. Just, there was a lot of fighting going on there. Rhodesia was going on. It was just finishing up, actually, at the time. So out of all the countries, the Philippines was the only ones that actually wrote back to me. So that's what this is. I keep going. All right, so here's a couple of pictures, um, just mercenary pictures of the head of my collection. And we didn't take a whole lot of pictures of ourselves in action. This is training. You can see I'm barefoot. It's because we were doing some water stuff and I was trying to dry my feet out, you know, so I didn't get trench foot. Okay, uh, this is actually one of the last missions I was on. Donnie, you don't even know about this one. <laughs> this was in uh, 2002 on the uh, U.S.-Mexican border doing drug interdiction for a rancher who was having his animals killed by the drug, drug lords coming through. Um, so we were clearing caves. Uh, this is a picture, uh, a friend of mine wrote a book, he was our medic, and he taught us all the medical stuff. This is me in the corner over here, looking at somebody I'll refer to as Captain Zack. Uh, Captain Zack was part of the force that um, deposed, not Idi Amin, but the, the dictator that was after him. Um, and then all we're doing is just digging out a bullet fragment from this guy's face. Here, next. Uh, this is me in Central America. Not quite the geeky little band kid anymore. I uh, just got back from a a five-day mission that ended up being a 10-day mission. Um, I'm a little emaciated there because uh, I went from 100 and, uh, I think it was about 156, 160 pounds. Donna can attest, when I came back, it was 132 pounds. Uh, we'd do about 20 miles a day with a full rucksack. Where, you know, it was a pretty hardcore mission. Um, so they took a picture anyways. Uh, next. Uh, again, this was one of my last missions. It was uh, the scout sniper team. He was a sniper. I was a scout. Uh, this here is a compensator. It's a very, very accurate rifle. And this is Mexico in the background. <laughs> and I, I lived in China for eight years. There's no guns in China. If you cop the bullet, they'll execute you. Um, I used to practice two, three hundred rounds a weekend when I was doing the work I was doing just to stay accurate. And after eight and a half years, I picked up a nine millimeter pistol and shot that group. <laughs> I just I like weapons. <laughs> but, um, here's me clearing a cave. Uh, this is me during a training session. This time is my friend Ken's turn to try out his feet. Um, but this is a training session down in Alabama. Um, all their weapons were full automatic and everything had licensed for them. Um, and then this again is me um, on the Mexican border. There are some next pictures. Yeah, this is just a rough neighborhood. Apparently when you go through a UN checkpoint, you've got to take out your magazine so you're not a threat to the UN soldiers. Uh, next. And then here's some paperwork. This is a certificate. I eventually went to work for this mercenary school, and uh, we would hand these out. We would get people from all over the country coming in, and we would uh, train them. And honestly, we'd use them mostly for cannon fodder to hone our skills. Um, you know, we would train them, but a lot of them just wanted to go down there and be able to shoot fully automatic weapons and have fun in the woods for a week or two, you know? So we would hand them out these certificates. This is a, just a typical uh, certificate. Frank Camper signed it. Um, when I came back from... Uh, Nicaragua, this actually showed up in the mail months later, I think it was in September. Um, 
I honestly didn't know that they were handing out certificates, but it was people that would donate, donate money toward the uh, civilian military assistance group, which uh, would get funded to help the Contras fight. Uh, Congress had shut off all their uh, financial aid, so they were looking for aid, you know, financial aid to continue the war. That's the next one. And this is my deportation papers from Honduras. Um, I didn't have enough money to get on a plane and get out of Honduras, so I had to pay $199.85 back to the government before they gave me my passport back. <laughs> okay. Um, we're talking about uh, events. Um, Donna can very well tell you, I was on the missing person list during the tsunami. Um, I was down in Thailand on vacation and decided I didn't want to be on the beach. I'd go fishing that morning, and that's why I'm standing here. Um, everybody else that we were with uh, perished. Uh, keep going. That's just an example. What's the next picks? All right. So, um, and you can kind of toggle through these. I just want to stress, you know, the human factor here. You know, I went from being somebody that wanted to do what was right for my country and being patriotic to just kind of twisting off. This is, here, go back one. This is me. I built this bike. This is me. And I used to race in China. I used to teach at a uh, school over there and stuff. But very untypical of me. I just kind of twisted off and just decided I'm just going to do my own thing. I saw George Carlin um, one time, and he said his concept of life and death was this. He was absolutely going to refuse to go to his grave quietly. He was going to come sliding in. Uh, I'll get rid of the expletives. He was going to come sliding in, all beat to tar, and say, man, what a ride. And that's kind of the way I lived my life after that. So uh, this is at the Shanghai International Raceway. I call this one Escape because we did it in black and white. It looks like we're escaping from a concentration camp. <laughs> but uh, we can talk about these. Um, social data, I just kind of did my own thing. I just lived on the edge. Um, you know, the skinny little band geek just started doing everything he wanted to do and didn't care. I was an adrenaline junkie. Had, you know, the more dangerous, the better. Let's go for it, you know? Um, I'm doing 150 miles an hour. You can see this little bump on the, uh, this is my knee dragging on the ground here. Um, I, I love racing. And this is me crashing and walking away. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next picture, I, I got pretty busted up, actually. This is titanium. And um, I hit it 100 miles an hour, so I mean, it, it smashed the titanium pretty hard. But, uh, you, know, you can just talk through these pictures. Um, the point being, I mean, this event completely affected my life. You know, we were talking about the human factor. Um, nothing good came from this event. Larry's life didn't get better. John's life didn't get better. My life didn't get better. There's nothing good that came of this. Um, I'm actually surprised that somewhere along the line in my mercenary career, somebody didn't just offer me to shut me up. But I guess maybe because I kept my mouth shut and I shown the whole UF scene, you know, there's probably a reason why. Uh, this scene here, uh, one of the things, um, as I said, I lived in China for eight and a half years, and this is actually an acting picture. I, I acted in a couple of movies and a couple of TV series over there. Um, this guy over here, I call him the Lee Marvin of China. <laughs> He's in like every war movie over there. He's the hero all the time. So, um, and then while I was over there, because I had such a strong military background, um, a security firm picked me up and I was able to do a lot of bodyguard work over there. And I bodyguarded like Celine Dion, uh, Beyonce, Tiger Woods. I could hang out with Tiger Woods for the week. That was pretty cool. Uh, Mick Jagger, uh, Christina Aguilera, uh, Eric Clapton. Uh, and then a lot of executives would go over there. Um, so, as I said, I just tried to live my life. You can just like, talk me through all these pictures. I, I've traveled all around the world. I've been to probably 16, 20 percent of the countries in the world is traveling around, seeing different cultures, um, whether it's Melbourne or uh, I guess that was Japan. Um, let's see, I've got to look at my notes here for a second. That's about it. This is me in uh, Egypt, playing the role. <laughs> they give all the tourists all the main headgear and stuff like that. But. Uh, these are my daughters playing with a camel. These are my pride and joy right here, these two girls. Um, my older daughter is uh, Aberdeen, and she's a nursing student uh, down at Peace University. And my younger daughter is actually an artist. Uh, and then this is down in the Amazon. So, anyway, so I really don't have much more to say than that. I'm, you know, this event, um, I think probably the most important thing to take away from this event is the reaction of the officers when they showed up. I kind of like to key in on that for a little bit. Um, when they showed up, you know, there's a lot of talk about what did they know, when did they know it, you know, that sort of thing. When these guys showed up, they didn't seem like they really had a clue about UFOs. I mean, you know, for somebody to bring their wife out 
and you stand up there and you don't want to be taking pictures and acting all giddy like she is and bringing her son out. I mean, I don't think they really understood what was going on. I, you know, it just doesn't seem to me like they were privy to it. Now, after the fact, they might have been. I know Malcolm Ziegler, or Major Ziegler, who was our commander, um, he did very well in the private security world afterwards and got, you know, a major government contract, you know. Um, Colonel Hall did okay. I'm sure he got snickered at behind his back a little bit, but, you know, he retired out of the Pentagon. He had a good career. All these officers did. Um, but regarding Ma Major Ziegler, um, I really have no respect for him, to tell you the truth. Um, he was our commander. He, you know, we were in his charge. He was supposed to be there to look out for us. And I think he, if he didn't feed us to the lions, he certainly stood by and watched him eat us. Um, oh, in this pipe. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of Georgina Rooney. Uh, I, I met her in England with Nick Pope. And uh, Georgina had confided in me that she had an issue with cancer. And uh, cancer patients are often given, you know, herbs to smoke to relieve their pain. So I carved this pipe up for her and sent it to her. <laughs> All right, um, next. And then this is me on the Chinese border with uh, Pakistan, which was a very dangerous place to be at the time. Uh, and this is my last slide right here. This is just me and my kids. And uh, pretty much that's all I live for these days is just to make sure they're taken care of. I mean, I really don't care about myself one way or another, to tell you the truth. I just want to make sure they get a good future and they're all set in their path in life. And uh, you know, so far so good. I'm doing okay. So um, if anybody's got any questions, I know I haven't spoken for an hour. I don't think I have, but has anybody got any questions? Anybody like to ask anything? I mean, I know I've been kind of brief and... Anyone? Anyone? Hi. Hi. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. more about More about what I'm... Oh, the craft? Um, yeah, well, the craft, it's, you ask asking more about the craft itself? Yeah, um, like I said, the craft, I had such tunnel, vi tunnel vision when I saw this, I don't even remember much other than the hatch and a couple of lights. It was like I was just focused on that. And um, it seemed like it was rounder, you know, just from the peripheral vision, but I, again, I had a lot of tunnel vision. Uh, it was dark in color. It was a structured craft. It wasn't. It wasn't a plinth. It wasn't anything that was see-through. It was a very structured craft. I remember seeing that hatch, like I said, and um, it just slowly pulled away. And I mean, I don't. I really can't describe it. I don't know it's other than that. I mean, it was, it was just so fogged out and tunnel vision on it. That's all I really saw. Uh, as it went away. You know, it was just basically a, a bright light. You know, it was, it was a craft. It was gray, grayish black, and uh, it took off. And it, as, as it got near the stars, it just seemed like it was a bright light, and just got smaller and smaller, and lifted up in elevation until it was, you know, it basically blended with the stars. Mm -hmm. That's today, maybe. Now, now they're called military contractors. <laughs> Back in the day, they were called mercenaries. Um, yeah, it's just one thing through, through another. Um, by going through Frank's school, um, you don't go to a, a, a very overt mercenary school and get a job. You train, and people pick you up and go, hey, this guy's kind of got some skills. And uh, through the old boy network, I'd get a call and say, hey, you know, there's a job coming up. Do you want to take it? Uh, one of the jobs I'll talk about, because you know, it's very public, um, was I was supposed to go down to the Philippines and got a radio station, like Radio Free Europe, they would have Radio Free Asia. Uh, only at the time, Corazon Aquino was trying to get $80 million worth of support from the United States government. Um, she was the newly elected president down there. Her husband had just gotten killed when, they, uh, when he landed on the tarmac. They executed him um, because uh, Marcos had just left and his people killed her husband. So um, this money was stalling in Congress. So Somebody called up, they said, hey, there's a job, you can do this, it pays X amount of dollars a week, okay, great, I'll go do the job. 
the problem was um, we always went into civilians. We'd go into a country on a tourist visa. Uh, we would meet whoever we needed. We'd get our gear, our equipment, and then we'd go do what we had to do. Um, and yeah, it was, we were threatened with jail time a lot. A lot. Um, when we got extracted out of Nicar uh, not Nicaragua, but Honduras, uh, the Honduran military came in, picked us up. We landed on the military base. We were immediately surrounded by a lot of troops with a lot of guns. Uh, they made a small perimeter, and then they made a larger perimeter, so if we broke through the first one, we'd get killed by the time we got to the second one. And we sat on the tarmac for six or eight hours, waiting for a uh, uh, decision on whether we were going to go to jail or whether they were going to deport us. And at the time, uh, Vice President Bush, it was Reagan was president at the time, happened to be in uh, Central America doing a Central American, you know, handshake tour, I called it. And uh, he stepped in and got, got me out of there, got us all out of there. Uh, but when we landed in the airport, the FBI was waiting for us. Uh, we were very scrutinized through customs, and Tom Brokoff was waiting for us. <laughs> and uh, the interview was never ever showed because of the vulgarity we spewed out on him and told him to go get lost. We really didn't want any part of the news or coverage. That was not what we were about. We didn't want our faces shown or anything. You know, this was our careers. This is what we're doing for a living. You know, if our faces were shown on TV, it was over. So, uh, but when when we were over in the Philippines, as I was saying. Uh, they wanted us to go out to the east coast of Luzon and guard this, uh, what I now know is a fictional um, uh, radio tower because on the way we were all going to get executed. They were going to make it look like U.S. civilians were killed so that this $80 million package would pass through Congress. So there was a lot of intrigue and who's who, what's what, and at that point I decided, hey, I don't even know what side I'm on anymore. So uh, I just decided to quit doing that, you know, so overtly. Um, but you know, honestly, you know, the, the person you see here today is not the person who was there at the time. I was a very, very evil, cold blooded individual. Um, I, you didn't want to meet me. I mean, I didn't, yeah, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. I was a very evil person back then. Okay, I had no soul, no conscience, and would do whatever I had to do. My God was clean and it had pictures of presidents on it. Okay, and that's all I cared about. Uh, my sister didn't even invite me to a wedding because I was supposed to be in Peru uh, doing some work against the shining path that was down there. So, I mean, it was just, my whole life was just, you know, for five, almost seven years after this was just, just a, just a mess. <laughs> you know, it took me a long time to get my head together, get my act together and say, hey, you know, I'm not going to let this define me. I'm going to go ahead and get on with my life. I, uh, I got in a bit of trouble here locally. Uh, I went out to California and uh, uh, quickly after I got my license out there, uh, I had the feds knocking on my door, the FBI and stuff like that. And I had to take care of some legal issues I had, one of them being the neutrality act issue I talked about. Um, I didn't want to go to jail for 35 years, so uh, so I cooperated with them. Every, everybody in our group cooperated with them, and it's not like it was a secret what they were doing. Um, and they didn't want us little fish anyways. They wanted all over the earth and those people, so they didn't really care about us anyway. Um, so I really wanted to be killed about talking openly about what happened there. But I, I worked with a lot of different, I worked with South Africans, Nigerians, I worked with a lot of different people around the world, and uh, uh, people that are now called terrorists and Al-Qaeda. Um, I gave medical uh, aid to the Mujahideen, and they turned into Al-Qaeda. I trained with the Panamanian Defense Force, and a year later we invaded Panama. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just amazing, just the intrigue and the backdoor stuff that goes on in that world. So, you know, like I said, you know, high IQ or not, when you can't figure out who's who or what's what, then it's just time to quit, you know. So, so I went up to California, uh, got a, got my life together, got married, had some kids. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> it wasn't easy getting there. <laughs> um, is the EP um, No, not really. I mean, I'm open to the concept. You know, I saw what I saw. I don't know what it is, but I did see something that I don't think was capable of any aircraft I've ever seen since. I mean, it's been 35 years and I still haven't seen a craft that can do what it did. So, I don't know where it came from. Right. really go off on the tangent here. I think you're back on the question of Soviet fortune. I won't say the rest of it. That's, that's fun. Huh? Uh, I don't know why this is. How would you like to course going through six weeks of basic training at Blackland and then uh, mm -hmm. about the following weeks on the security Oh, well, that was, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, it was very, very different. Um, 
You know, when you've got the U.S. government backing you up and providing you with meals and this and that, we would go to a typical training session. We would um, not let the students sleep for the first 72 hours. If they got sleep, it was by accident. Um, they'd get an hour or two a night. We would run them ragged just to weed out the weaklings. Um, and then we would start our training on Monday. Because it typically... Yeah, 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 very much so, yeah, very much. And um, we would train with uh, live ammo. The, the bullet that was getting dug out of that guy's face, we shot him. <laughs> Was a ricochet off the ground and he got a piece in his face. Um, when we would do training, we would um, um, use pellet guns to let you know you're screwed up. You know, we've shot people in the eyes by accident. Um, you know, you know, you see somebody in the woods, you shoot them with a pellet gun, let them know, hey, you got seen, you know. But it's very intense. Um, we, we would shove a lot of training in a few weeks and uh, a lot of weapons training, a lot of patrolling, and you can't get what you need in a few weeks. So uh, just a lot of veterans in the class. Oh yeah, yeah, and we have people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we had people come in from Saudi Arabia, we had people, we had French Foreign Legionnaires come and train with us. And I got a great training, because being cadre and being part of the, uh, the training group there and stuff, I got to train with people from all over the world, learned a lot of great skills and techniques that I think kept me alive, you know. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. But, but it, it, can I explain just a little bit on that? The training in the Air Force, now we went through our, you know, basic training, we went through our security training, but once we got to the base, we also had more training. There was a lot of OJT training that went on after that as well. Um, every base is specific. You had to learn about the country and what the rules were. Uh, when can you engage somebody, that sort of thing. Hello. Thank you very much for your service. No, no, but can I jump in on that? I've been in a lot of life-threatening situations and th situations where your adrenaline is really pumping. Um, I, I can remember my first firefight, I, I didn't hear anything going on. I heard guns going off, I knew what was going on, but it seemed like my ears, like, like somebody put earmuffs on my ears. Um, it was very, you know, I was very focused on what I was doing. My mind was going 100,000 miles an hour while everything was in slow motion at first until I kind of got oriented on what was going on. Um, and then a lot of the motorcycle accidents, I've, I've broken well over 30 bones racing bikes. I, I kind of lost track, actually, I stopped counting. But, um, but when you go and crash, um, you know, you're on, you're on such an adrenaline rush. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever really been in like major car accidents or had a, you know, an adrenaline rush like that, but your body is still going through the motion, but your mind is just going 100 miles an hour trying to figure out how do you get out of this and survive. And, and I, honestly, I can't remember any sounds of any of my crashes I've had. I mean, it's very quiet and it's, your mind's just going so bad. I, I think that blocks out the sounds other than the sounds you need to hear to survive, to, you know, if your body would figure out what to do. So, so I'm, I'm thinking that's probably part of it was just, you know, your body's shutting down and taking care of your brain and your body, and your ears don't really matter that much because, you know, you're trying to... Well, thank you again for coming. All right. You're welcome. What we're going to do right now is hold the rest of the questions for question and answers. We're going to take 10 minutes. It'll be your last time to make book purchases or any of the other vendors. Um, please, again, I encourage you to buy some of our raffle tickets. Bring some chairs up on the stage here, and then we'll complete it with our question and answer. Thank you so much, Steve LeBlum. Thanks. <laughs> wow. That I did. A pro. Okay. miles an hour. Body just...